Hi, good afternoon everyone. Yeah, my name is Matt Winter and I work as one of the operational hydrometeorologists at the Flood Forecasting Centre in Exeter. And I'm going to give you a general overview really of the FFC, basically uh, the origins of the Flood Forecasting Centre, how we're structured and what we do. Um, I'll talk about our flood guidance statement, which is kind of the main flagship product in which we communicate flood risk assessments for a five day plus period. I'll briefly talk about a couple of our new tools and products, and then I'll just finish on some of our future challenges. So this is really meant to be a broad brush intro introduction to Flood Forecasting Centre. So what is the FFC? Where did it come from? Well, if you cast your minds back to 2007, there was widespread disruptive <coughs> flooding across large parts of England and Wales, with significant to severe impacts across um, central southern England, with the Midlands hit particularly bad. And as a result of that, um, the government basically commissioned the pit review, which looked at all aspects of that flooding, from the warning and informing to the actions taken within the flooding event and also kind of the post-event recovery phases. And one of the key parts of that for the FFC was um, key recommendation six. And essentially, the report suggested that the Met Office had done a very good job with warning and informing with their National Severe Weather Warning Service in terms of the rainfall aspect. The Environment Agency had done a good job with their short um, lead time um, flood warnings and flood alerts. Um, but there was nothing really that kind of bridged the, the longer range gap in terms of flood risk assessment. So the proposal was that the Met Office and the Environment Agency should come together as a joint centre and produce longer range flood risk assessment for at least a kind of five day period. So that's essentially the, um, the embryo starting point of the FFC. Uh, back in 2008 and by November that year a management team was already in place um, ready to set up an operational centre um, for the FFC. So by April 2009 we started to work operationally as a 24-7 for a year pilot pro project and that was actually quite a fortuitous time to be setting up because uh, if you look back to November 2009 Cumbria saw some of its worst um, flooding in sort of recent history aside from 2015. Um, so it's kind of a very good test case for the FFC and they actually provided some really good value during that, um, that scenario. So the value of the centre was proven and business case was approved and full funding was then put in place to provide a permanent um, funded FFC. And originally it was based in London. By April 2011 we moved to Exeter, which is where the HQ um, Met Office is and the FFC have been there ever since. I joined in 2013 and ever since then it's really been about making things more resilient, more efficient, and pulling through new science to operations on the bench, and just looking at continually improving our products and services. So that's kind of the stage we're at now. So how do we work? As I explained, the recommendation was to set up this joint centre, and that's exactly what we do. We're a 50-50 um, ratio partnership between the Environment Agency and the Met Office, and that split is right down the staff um, through the management and also the operation side. So 50% of the staff are EA, 50% are from the Met Office and the work in this joint centre. We've got a remit to forecast for all natural sources of flooding. Um, by that we're talking about coastal river, surface water and groundwater. And we do that essentially in the form of the flood guidance statement. And the good thing about the, um, the FFC is we, because we're we're a, a split um, or a joint centre with EA and Met Office staff. All the operational staff go through the same training. So we've got 16 operational hydrometeorologists and we've got nine uh, management staff, so 25 in the team altogether. But um, the, meter the, the meteorologists in the team, so those coming from the Met Office originally, do some extensive hydrology training and the EA staff do some extensive meteorology training. And so we're all very consistent in our ability to provide flood risk assessments and we're kind of under this relatively new discipline called hydrometeorologists. So we operate a 24-7 centre, and that's been since April 2009. So every hour of every day, every year, um, there's someone sat at the bench, keeping an eye on the weather, looking at the antecedent conditions, and preparing products and guidance for our customers. And we also have an ops manager who's around during um, daytime hours, and that's backed up by um, FFC duty manager roster, which again cover a 24-7 hour period and they deal at a slightly higher strategic level um, in terms of warning and informing. So we generally work the same roster as the rest of the operational Met Office, and that's day, day, night, night, sleep. Um, but things are slightly different in the FFC, and we're quite unique in the way we're set up. So we work operationally on the bench as a, as a duty um, role 
for this day-day, night-night sleep, and then three off pattern. And then we're on call for that same roster pattern, and then we go um, back on as the lead hydromet. And we do that for kind of a period of six months. And then we go into what we call an operation, uh, sorry, development or a continual service improvement phase for two months. And that's quite unique to the FFC. And what that enables us to do is to have the hydrometeorologists come off the bench for two months, and they'll be working Monday to Friday instead of um, weekends and days and night shifts. Concentrating on liaising with um, science, um, improving our um, current products and services, and pulling through new science to operations. So it's quite a unique model um, that the FFC has, and other areas of the Met Office are kind of looking at exploiting a similar system. So we'll be on the bench for six months, we'll do this um, CSI block for two months, on the bench for four months operationally, and then back off for two, and it continues around in that sort of development block cycle. So a little bit about the FGS, the Flood Guidance Statement. It's our flagship product. It's the main way we can communicate flood risk assessment from all those four sources for a five-day period, and it's supported by a whole raft of other models and tools which have been in development over the last uh, sort of 10 years and continue to be developed on a day-to-day -day basis. And as I say, we've got a remit um, to provide flood risk assessment for those four sources of flooding for a five-day period, although we also look beyond that, and we're starting to do a lot more horizon scanning to try and identify the next severe weather event. And importantly, we use what we call a reasonable worst outcome, reasonable case worst outcome for the um, impact matrix. And we'll talk more about the impact matrix in a little bit. And by reasonable worst case, um, what we're trying to do is identify the potential for a severe um, impact level event, even if it's only got a low probability of occurring. And that's all kind of tied into the Environment Agency's idea of um, thinking big and acting early if we think there's a potential for a um, severe flood event. Generally, the FFC hydrometeorologists are responsible for the three to five day period of that um, five day FGS uh, risk assessment product. Um, and the EA focus on days one to two. And the reason we do it that way is because the Environment Agency and NRW um, Natural Resources Wales have got much finer resolution catchment scale models to look at flooding at um, a, a lower scale than we do. Um, and what we're, we're more about is providing strategic level guidance at the county or unitary authority level. And that's generally the way the FFC, the FFC is set up in terms of how we give that guidance. So we issue at least one FGS a day, and that's generally at 10.30 but that depends on the overall flood risk level highlighted in the FGS. So the higher the flood risk level, the greater the requirement to have more regular updates, and we might end up um, producing an update later in the afternoon and potentially also in the evening, and we could also do an early issue if it, if it warrants it. And the main audience is Category 1 and 2 responders. And what I mean by Category 1 and 2 responders is Category 1 responders are the main emergency services, so we're talking about police, fire, ambulance, and also the county councils. And category two responders are kind of a, a tier slightly um, below that, uh, and it's generally looking at utilities and infrastructure um, across England and Wales. And our flood guidance statement is only for England and Wales. We don't include Scotland. Scotland do a separate product, um, SEPA, um, for, for their NFGS. And it's generally used as a trigger, and what I mean by that is someone will receive the FGS at 10.30 whenever it's issued. I'll have a little look through, and if there's a specific colour um, or a um, elevated flood risk for their area of responsibility, then they'll go through perhaps a flow chart and a risk of actions they'll, or a number of actions they'll take based on that flood risk information. Risk-based approach to con content, as I said, it's based on a reasonable worst case. And we tend to include a greater amount of geographical information when we're highlighting a medium likelihood of minor impacts or above. So by that I mean it's the bottom end of green nudging into yellow, and we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a second. And that's um, just to add a bit more value to the, the, the general thumbnail maps of the flood guidance statement. And all that will become a bit more apparent on the uh, forthcoming slides. It's very important to say that this isn't done independently. The FGS is very much a collaborative product, and it actually goes through quite a large number of steps before it's finally issued. So the night shift look at all the meteorological conditions. They look at the antecedent conditions, how wet the catchments are, what the river levels are like, whether we're in a period of spring tides, for instance. They'll tie those things all in together and they'll chat to the chief and the deputy chief forecasters at the Met Office. And amongst them, we'll, we'll kind of come up with a, a general story um, and uh, an idea of what we think the uh, risk level is from all sources of flooding. Um, we'll issue that as a draft. And then the day shift come in at 7.30, 7.45 and look through 
the feedback coming back from Environment Agency and NLW. The draft only goes out to those individuals. And then also be looking at all the latest model output. And that's quite an important point because a whole raft of new model runs comes in after the night shift leaves and the day shift comes on. And if the forecast is quite uncertain, the, the general story can actually swing quite dramatically from what's gone out in the draft FGS to what we put out in the final FGS. So it's very important that we nail the detail down in that quite early on and communicate when there are significant changes in the draft to our partners. We get strategic level input from our FFC duty managers and also from colleagues in the Environment Agency and NLW. And then we tie all that together in a teleconference with all the Environment Agency and NRW monitoring, forecasting duty officers at 9.45. And then finally, the FGS goes out at 10.30. So as I say, it's very much a collaborative process, and it's not done by one individual person. So what does it look like? Some of you might be familiar with this, um, some of you not, but this is what the FGS looks like, the guidance statement. It's gone through a really big um, rehash and kind of rebrand over the last uh, year or so. And the main focus has been reducing the overall words, making things clearer and concise, bringing the graphics to the front of the, pro the um, product and letting the graphics do the talking. And this is what I mean by an area of concern map. We've, we've got a geographical area with our green and yellow polygons showing um, the risk areas along with some uh, text and impact boxes there. We've also got thumbnail maps along the top, which gives you at a quick glance um, any impacts for any of the counties or UAs in England um, and Wales for the five-day period. And we've also got um, some trend arrows, which is a new addition. And essentially, that's the change in the forecast for that day um, on this FGS compared to the previous days issued. So people can see whether there's a general change in story. Is the flood risk increasing? Is it decreasing? Or is it just stable? That was the first page. The second page tends to have the writing. So we've moved the writing to the back of the, um, the product and we try to minimalize, min minimalize this and make it consistent. So it doesn't matter which Hydromet's writing it, it should look very similar to, um, to the customer. And we start with the highest flood risk at the top and we work down to the lowest flood risk at the bottom. So again, the important information is at the top. And finally on the back, there's a little picture of the impact matrix um, and also a summary of what we mean by minimal, minor, significant and severe on the right hand side. And that's all contained within the document. So users have got a reference to what we're referring to when we talk about those impact levels. So I think it's important to focus on the flood risk matrix and what this actually means. Again, this might be familiar to some people because it's almost an exact copycat of the National Severe Weather Warning Service impact matrix, which um, was started after the 1987 storms. And essentially, we've got a likelihood scale on the left-hand side going from very low to high. We've got an impact scale running from left to right on the bottom, going from minimal through minor, significant and severe. And the important thing about any risk assessment, uh, and the flood risk assessment is no different, is it's a combination of likelihood and impact. So it's not a simple traffic light system. And this is one of the key messages that we try and tell the users of the flood guidance statement. You really need to look at where the tick is in the box. A lot of people just look at the FGS when it comes through. They see it's yellow and they think, OK, I'll keep an eye on that. And we'll monitor things over the next coming days. But why are we yellow? And that's a really, really important question. So as I say, we start to get interest when we're in the, the top end of green or the bottom end of yellow. And that's what we call the 2 2 box. So when we're suggesting a medium likelihood of minor impacts, and that's when we'll start to include an area of concern map within our flood guidance statement to add some extra spatial information. But really, people tend to get um, interested once we start to see some colour on there. And by colour, uh, I mean the overall flood risk. So on the right-hand side, um, we've got some terminology for what the overall flood risk is from very low, low, medium to high, and the colour that's associated with that. But as I say, there's, there's many ways you can be yellow, and it's really important to know which yellow you are, which 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 reasoning um, is driving the yellow coloration. Because the, the actions you might take as a responder would be different if you were expecting a medium likelihood of minor impacts, um, as opposed to if there was a real chance, um, potentially, of seeing some severe flooding somewhere, which is also yellow. So it's really key to, to make sure you know um, which box we're in. And it's the same with, with amber as well. Um, amber comes in to start with when we're suggesting a medium likelihood of significant impacts but actually, um, the top end of amber is just one box below the highest alert level we can be, which is red. 
um, uh, high zero raw flood risk. So it's really important to look at where the tick is in the box, and we, we just try to re reiterate that to our customers. And one other important thing is it's um, really key for us to try and align with the National Severe Weather Warning Services whenever we can. So they put out warnings in parallel a lot of the time for our, um, for our rainfall warnings if we're thinking there'll be impacts from surface water and river flooding, for instance. But once the rain's kind of hit the ground, um, from an Israel's perspective, it's not really uh, an issue and a warnable um, parameter. Whereas for us, uh, rivers could continue to respond for two, three, four, perhaps even five days in some of the longer responding rivers in England and Wales. And so we'll continue to um, warn for that. We may be coloured up on the flood guidance statement when there's no national severe weather warning service warning out. And conversely, um, NISWARS may have a warning out, uh, say an amber or even a red warning for wind. Um, we wouldn't necessarily be putting any warning out for that unless we thought there were coastal impacts that were associated with it. So again, there is some room to manoeuvre um, for not being aligned, but generally try to align as much as we can. I thought I'd share this slide with you because it's, I find this really interesting. This is basically a barcode calendar of the forecast flood risk over the last um, six years, really. And what we're looking at is the highest um, flood risk coloration on the FGS of any day in the five-day period when it was issued. And it highlights our operational busyness, I suppose, is a, is a good way to put it. So I can, you can see through 2012, especially the summer period, um, things were pretty bad in terms of surface water flooding and also river flooding, and that was leading up to the Olympics. So particularly problematic time for NISWARS and the, um, and the Flood Forecasting Centre, including some red coloration for Devon and Cornwall there. And it led into a you know, relatively wet winter, but things tended to ease off by the beginning of 2013. And pretty much here is where I finished my training and virtually nothing happened for most of 2013. And then winter 2013-14 came along and gave me a bit of a kick up the jack seat. Possibly one of the busiest periods, certainly for the FFC, and probably the Met Office as a whole in term of, terms of warning and informing, with storm after storm after storm coming through. Um, we were seeing significant to severe levels of flooding, multi-source, multi-day, throughout the winter period with most of that red coloration focused on the Thames and the Somerset levels, but it continued right the way through until the spring. And then the other thing that's quite interesting to pick out is the end of 2015, so Storm Desmond and Eva highlighted there. Again, record rainfall seen across northwest England with um, severe disruption for Cumbria and sort of Lancashire. And then things have been relatively quiet um, since then, so it's almost kind of everyone's waiting for when the next big event might be. So our vision statement is just there up, um, on the slide behind me, and it's about providing trusted guidance to help protect lives and livelihoods from flooding. Um, I think it's quite a nice, catchy phrase, and from our overall satisfaction um, scores from the flood guidance statement, people are fairly happy with the products that we put out. However, how, how do we do that when the forecast is often so uncertain? And I thought I'd just share a quick scenario with you, um, which I was faced with on my last set of shifts. So this was the Thursday, coming off the Thursday night shift just before Easter. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got the global model, and this is rainfall amounts for Easter Monday. The central picture is from ECMWF, again, 24-hour rainfall amounts for Easter Monday, and the far side is the um, US GFS model. So we, we look at a lot of model data, and using this technique, comparing three models, we roughly call it a poor man's ensemble. And the problem with this scenario is there's virtually no rainfall across um, central England and Wales, and not very much across the southeast of England. And the Environment Agency and NLW essentially get this data feed along with the high-res models that come off it. So in all their flooding um, models, essentially there was virtually no rainfall going into it, whereas a most likely scenario was there was going to be widespread rainfall across parts of England and Wales, and there's a potential for it to be very heavy and lead to flooding. So how do we kind of get around that? Well, we try and provide alternative scenarios whenever we can. So this is called a rainfall map, and it's something we've been developing over the last year or two. It's pretty simplistic, but what it allows the EA and NLW to do is take the numbers that we've put in against the polygons. So we've got various, various um, uh, rainfall amounts across various time periods, and it allows them to put alternative values into their models to have a look at what the um, impact of that rainfall is in terms of flooding so that then they can feed back into the flood guidance statement and we can get a consistent message out. And of course, all this is also done by looking at you know, a suite of ensemble data and liaising with the deputy chief and the chief forecasters and what the most likely scenario and the reasonable worst case might be. So that's kind of how we get around it. 
very quickly, I'll just talk through some of our new products. Um, one of the pressures for us and for all national MET services, I think, across the world is to try and extend our lead times on warnings and also to improve accuracy. And I think that pressure is only going to at least be maintained, if not increase, over the coming years. And um, this is one way we try to do it in a broad brush fashion for a month period. So this is what we call a flood outlook. And essentially, we break down the four sources of flooding as we do with the flood guidance statement. And we try and provide some regional level advice, so not county level, because that's too fine for a month um, long period, regional level guidance for where we might see an increased risk of flooding over that month long period. It's, it has to be quite broad brush just because of the nature of the data that we're dealing with. But in some instances, it can provide some um, good guidance as to likely. Um, flood risk increases through that period. And again, we try and make the graphics do the talking, but you can't help but have a fair amount of wording in there as well to support the graphics. So just here on the left-hand side, we've got a picture of um, the rainfall sensitivity, and that's based on uh, the last five days' rainfall. And then we've got our bar um, charts at the top for each of the sources of flooding, whether we think it's uh, got a low, medium, or high likelihood of occurring. And then the second page shows the likely weather regimes that we're expecting. So this is for um, December, and um, the two graphics included there. And we also include some graphics for the latest groundwater levels and the uh, river levels for the past month. So we can time, with, time the likely weather with what the antecedent conditions are doing. And again, it's supposed to be more, more graphical than, um, than wordy. So something that's featured on the National Risk Register since 2017, the update, is surface water. And again, there's more emphasis on us now trying to give better predictions on when we might see surface water flooding. And the catchly titled Surface Water Flooding Hazard Impact Model is one way that we're trying to do that. So output from that is on the right-hand side. And essentially, we're going through the third season of an operational trial this summer to see if we can make the tool operational in time for 2019. And essentially, all it does is it looks at an ensemble, um, an ensemble of runoff, and it compares that to underlying uh, impact library. And it gives you some idea of where impacts might be in a severity level and the likelihood at kilometer squares, and also it upscales that to a county level. So initially, it could, it could provide some good guidance for our um, flood guidance statement. So this is from um, June 2016. As I say, the model data is on the right-hand side, and then this is what we had in the flood guidance statement on the left. This is the old-style flood guidance statement. Um, with the thumbnail map in the top left, and then these are the observed impacts. So in some instances, and I've obviously shown you a good one here, um, it can provide some, some valuable guidance, um, other times not so much so, which is why we're going through another uh, operational trial. So one other quick thing to kind of finish on. This is something I've been working on as part of a sort of personal research project, and it's whether we could look at creating a quick look or a graphic enhancement tool. It's all very good having high-resolution models, but if they're not showing the right amount of rainfall because they're not the, um, the perhaps the, the global model and its high resolution models aren't the preferred solution on day four or five, ECMWF might be. It, it's, it's good to have a, a quick look empirical tool that you can use for some sensitivity testing. So this is something that I've been interested in and it's um, basically a satellite image showing layered precipitable water for an atmospheric river. So it's when we have these long warm conveyors drawing up moisture from the subtropics. And coupled with strong winds, bringing that across the high ground in North Wales and northwest England brings the potential for high rainfall and flooding. And all I did was I had a look at observed rain gauge amounts, and I worked out the observed moisture flux just to see if there was a correlation between those two things, which it looks like there is for both hourly rainfall accumulations and accumulations throughout the whole rainfall event. And what this might allow us to do... <coughs> is use forecast parameters of moisture flux in a quick look tool that we can just plug some numbers in into an Excel spreadsheet to do some sensitivity testing if, say, the global model and its UKV high res um, isn't our um, preferred solution. So just to finish on a few future challenges, and you know, it's not just the Met Office that's faced with the problem of um, large data volumes. I think that's kind of across, across, the, board, um, across the board for many, many work areas. I was chatting to one of the chief forecasters yesterday, and I think in sort of two, three years' time, we're going to be looking at 60 terabytes of model data being available every day, which is a vast amount of data, and simply at the moment, the, moment, the infrastructure can't cope with that. So we're going to increasingly need to look at new novel ways to handle these large amounts of data, 
and to get the data to flag to us potentially when there's a deviation between the model forecast and the observations. Um, because increasingly there's going to be more data than we're uh, actually able to look at um, as resolution si uh, increases and ensemble members increase. And this expectation of greater accuracy at longer lead times, and the government you know, put in £100 million for the latest supercomputer, and people want to see that money coming back in terms of us being able to warn and inform earlier. So you know, there's always a greater expectation um, that, of us being able to do that. So I think it's important to keep pulling through science, the operations, benching the form of new tools to help us address that. And better systems for model, model, modelling and verifying impacts. Um, it's all very well being able to say that we've got a high likelihood of seeing 50 mils of rain in 12 hours across a certain part of England or Wales, but what does that mean in terms of impacts? So a bit like the hazard impact model I showed you before, I think there's going to be more emphasis on looking at trying to, um, to bring that hazard impact information into our, into our modelling. And a lot of that is also linked into verifying. Um, we look at social media quite a lot now in order to look at what the impacts are, and that that verification data comes in quite quickly compared to other um, sources of information. So I think there's a treasure trove of information in social media that we're, we're needing to mine in, um, in better ways to, to verify our impact. And the EA um, have got this thing called FFS, Future Flood Forecasting System, where they're looking at probabilistically representing um, the modelling flooding throughout the whole chain right down to impact level, and that's going to involve pulling whole load of um, deterministic and probabilistic data into their system. So there's a large amount of uh, management to, to kind of make that happen. So in summary, operational flood forecasting is a complex process. And I think when we collaborate and we use innovative techniques, I think we can get some novel solutions to help us uh, increase our accuracy and better communicate flood risk across the board. And that's going to be increasingly important. The way the FSC is split up between our operations and our continual service improvement block is a unique way of operating, and I think it puts us in an ideal place to pull through that new science to the operations bench. And yeah, this is big pressure to increase our, our lead times, and more and more we're looking at horizon scanning at, at least 10 to 15 day and providing briefing notes when we think there's a potential for um, severe flooding impacts. But by doing that, we allow people to better prepare and better mitigate against severe flooding. Uh, I think that's it, unless there's any questions. Any questions from anyone? Yeah. This next up was uh, more interesting. I just wanted to provide my comments on the um, long term significance. So, obviously, there's been a recent question on the back end, seeing the photos of the winter analysis as well as the major school photos and the top photos and so on. Um, but um, you showed a very interesting uh, barcode candidate. Uh, is that based purely on the geological or biological factors, or does it take into account changes in land use or, or human impacts or use of the environment? Because if, if you could extend that back to the time, maybe we've already done this, then actually place some of those recent events in the longer term, but significant context. So um, I know you've got people showing on for the group, for example, who uh, are interested in some of the same. Yeah, I mean, the, the barcode code, the barcode code, um, essentially, that, all I was looking at was the, the highest um, yeah. flow of the tiles and the FGS at that time period. Um, so, here we go. Um, it takes into kind of all the impact factors that we account for now. I, I suppose it hasn't really changed the, the terminology that we use for minimal, minor, significant and severe in terms of the impacts um, that we're sort of highlighting. But I guess one of the main things that we're, we're starting to get a bit cleverer with is identifying where there are elevated risks. And I think Christian mentioned this before. Um, things like time of day comes into account a bit more frequently um, where you've got populations gathering in the terms of music events or festivals. All, all these things I think we're thinking about in more detail than we have before, and of course that may potentially have changed our coloration at some point on, on the FGS for barcode calendar, but I think generally that provides a pretty accurate idea of what's happened over the last six or seven years, and, and that's not exactly what happened in terms of observations. Obviously this was 
the forecast on the day, but the two things marry up fairly well in most instances. Does that sort of answer your question? This actually is quite a quite a curious relationship to what's going on because, for instance, the big red block there. I think the Somerset levels was red for the whole time, but the levels were flooded. So, in terms of thinking about climate change, for instance, it's not a yeah. terribly helpful. There's, and there's big question marks about how we deal with the very long duration, yeah. initially severe flooding impacts. Once it's happened and we've warned and informed about it, and perhaps the numbers of people affected aren't as large as they would be in other parts of the country, do we continue to highlight that as... A issue. Exactly. <laughs> a lot of it's politically driven, um, and things can, te- can change quite markedly from what you intend to put out on your draft FGS, and then what's discussed at a higher strategic level, and the advice that comes back down again. So I think we're always, we're always talking about different ways we can communicate that in the future. If I could um, have a, a second go. Um, you, you mentioned the issue of orographic enhancement. Yeah. And there is quite a history of little pieces of research in the Met Office on that. I don't know if you've found them all. Um, but in particular, the work on the orographic enhancement corrections in the radar system um, should provide you with quite a good starting point, I think. Yeah, I think for the, the highest peaks of the Cumbrian High Fells, for instance, which is where we often have trouble providing um, good estimates of overall rainfall accumulations, I think a lot of that's linked heavily to the NWP data as well. Um, so Not the radar accumulations don't always give you the, the yeah, answer. Yeah, actually, the um, enhancement that's added in okay, yeah. is based on the moisture content upstream and the wind speed and so on. Yeah. Um, so, yes, the, the, um, the actual values that have gone in may not be what you want because they've come from the model. Yeah. But the formula might be exactly what you want. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and it, it is published somewhere. Yeah. And in our, in our orographic enhancement tool that we use at the moment, it's based on science um, that came out in the 1970s that I think Manchester Weather Centre used quite a lot, um, uh, which is a pretty simple wet bulb potential temperature times by gradient wind speed. The uh, radar stuff was done in the 90s, so it should be more up to date. Yeah, okay, I can chase, I can chase that up. Yeah. Um, just a question about the uh, impact factors in the risk matrix. Yeah. Um, I've noticed sort of reviewing um, the forecasts that go out from the EA, CIFO, and Matthew Wills as well, as you say, that there's a lot more which tend to be um, put out for Wales, uh, sorry, for England than either Hickson, Wales, and for Scotland. Is, and I wonder whether that's due to the fact that you've got the higher population density and the impact is at that reflected within the impact? Yeah, and that should be taken into account, uh, along with kind of the, the time of day that the rainfall's happening. And you're right, but I think even more so, you tend to see a bias more towards South Wales than you do in other parts of Wales because population centres have shifted more geographically south in, in Wales. So I think that, that can sometimes be the case. There shouldn't be too much different between, difference between England and Wales because it's being produced by the flood forecasting centre. So you know, we're doing both those things for England and Wales. Sometimes there could be slight differences around the border region between what's produced by SEPA in their um, FGS statement and what we produce in ours. But generally, we try and include them in our teleconferences and we discuss any of those issues before we have a misalignment around the border. So, is the sort of local population density a factor that's considered yeah. in that yeah. yeah, especially so with, with surface water flooding during the, um, the summer season. All right, any more questions? No? Okay. Well, I'm just going to ask in my perception from 2007 was that the flood was reasonably well forecast but then we believed it. Um, have, you seen, have you seen subsequently more people taking up the flood forecasts, more people acting on them? Do you want the evidence of more people acting on what's happened? That's, yeah, that's a good question. I um, don't know directly about that. Um, It often depends on what's driving the forecast because, again, it comes down to this misconception of well, you don't want people to think that you're over-warning and informing. So there's only a limited amount of times that 
people kind of will look at a forecast when we're saying there's a very low likelihood of significant flooding happening. And if it doesn't happen seven or eight times, then people tend to lose interest in a little bit and perhaps don't take notice the next time. But according to probability, you know, if it happens one in seven times, then that, that could still fit in with a very low likelihood of, of it occurring. So I think, yeah, I think there is a perception that perhaps warnings are overly, um, overly warned for. Uh, but that's based on a probabilistic forecast. So it's always the problem communicating that to the public, I think. I mean, prior to, to, to it and prior to the FFC, as far as I know, that there were no war, long, I mean, medium range warnings of floods. No, exactly. There, there, was, there, was, there was the short there flood. Was there. Yeah, there was the short flood warnings that the EA and NRW put out, and there was the Met Office and ISWAS warnings. There wasn't anything specifically for flooding beyond a day, really. So, in the sense that people can now take. Early warning, uh, sorry, early action. Yeah. Um, and, and we might not see that. That might be stopped by the sand, sandbags or whatever. And, and actually, the huge growth in use of, um, of temporary defences yeah. is only possible because yeah. of the changes. Yeah. So, so actually, the, the change is huge. Yeah. We just we, we've come to, to assume that it's there. Sort of. 